All right. It says we're live here. How's everybody doing? Good afternoon, everybody out there. All right, give it just another minute or two here, I guess. Make sure everybody's tuned in and everything. Um, it's kind of a cold, windy day today. Uh, they were only calling for uh, not quite an inch of snow yesterday, and we actually got about five inches up where we're at, and uh, so I had to do some work this morning plowing and snow blowing and whatever else not a huge amount of snow but i had to get that done and we had to do a few little uh um, errands and things this morning so that's why i didn't there wasn't the live stream announcement wasn't out uh, early today so but today we're going to talk about growing food raising food and finding food okay um Again, my experience, and I'm not an expert in all of these different things. Um, in fact, I'm not an expert in any of them, but I'm learning, and um, I, have a, I do have some experience with some of it. So um, growing food, We're, we'll talk first about growing food, uh, a garden slash orchard, you know, orchard for your fruit trees and whatever else, garden for your, you know, different types of vegetables or even some smaller fruits and whatever else. Uh, questions that you have to ask yourself. First off, what crops grow best in your climate? Now, I have here the USDA plant hardiness zone map here, and you can look this up on your own, uh, Google that term or whatever else, and you can see the kind of thing that grows best in your area. We're kind of up in here in the in this area, up in there, if you can see the little magnifying glass. So there's a lot of plants that we can't grow here. Um, I was born and raised down in southeastern Pennsylvania, which is down in the green area there. So um, gardening and everything else was a lot you know, easier down there. Again, if you saw the one off-grid seminar I did on warm, warm versus cold climates, that's a, a big consideration, the kind of plants that you can grow. Um, and there are actually plants that we can grow up here, especially the wild edibles, that aren't really going to grow too well down south. So kind of an interesting thing there. Um, another question would be what type of soil do you have? Um, if you're in a really mountainous area, you might not have very deep soil. You might have really um, not the best soil where you're at. Um, and of course, you can get around that by doing raised bed gardens. Um, you can also do what's called a hugel culture, which is basically rotted logs or old rotting logs. And then you put dirt on top of that and then you plant your garden on top of that. Um, a lot of permaculture, you can study all that stuff too. Um, some really fascinating things with that. Um, what about getting water for your crops? Is it going to, you get enough rain? Um, is there some way you can do kind of irrigation or something like that? Um, that's another big thing to consider um, when growing uh, food with a garden and whatever else. Um, protection from animals. Again, um, what type of animals do you have in your area? Um, I'll tell a little funny story here. Not really funny, it was a tragic story. Um, uh, I planted some gar uh, uh, garlic on our property at one point in time. And there was an area where they had logged and it was a lot of rotted wood and everything. So I thought, oh, it'll be kind of almost like a hugel culture with the rotted wood underneath and some dirt on top of that. And so I was all happy and I went out and I took my gar garlic cloves and I stuck them in the ground, you know. And and everything not long after that a week or so after that the, you know they were actually starting to grow and I thought wow this is great yeah you know, I've never been much of a gardener I'm more of the wild hunting foraging type but uh, I thought hey this is great we'll have garlic you know fresh garlic here on our property and everything else and I got up the one morning and I was walking out towards where I had my garden at and uh, hear this noise and this big bull moose comes up out of the weeds and he's chewing and I thought what in the world what's what are you doing there and you know, go on get and everything and he he left he got out of there um 
there's we have a big bull moose that likes to hang out on our property and but he he kind of just trotted off and then they kind of stop and look back kind of don't try following me i'll you know stop you good or whatever <laughs> but uh so i didn't think anything of it well i went back to check later that day on my garlic you know crop and it was all gone so the the moose you know he had some good garlic there i guess but uh <laughs> so much for my experience with gardening but um we actually had another guy a neighbor of mine was telling me that there's a um, big broccoli farm up going up towards presque isle and uh and he know he's related to him his last name's smith and he's related to the family i guess that runs that cousins or something like this and um he said that the moose came in one night and, and it had to have been a couple of them but they ate 40 acres of broccoli destroyed uh, 40 acres of broccoli i don't know if it was one night i shouldn't say one night but it was maybe a couple nights or whatever but yeah 40 acres so you get you know a moose they can do a lot of damage quickly so you if you live in an area even deer or whatever else um you have to make sure that you have fencing up and whatever around your garden and that can run into a lot of money depending on what type of fencing that you buy so all they all those things are considerations and again i'm i'm speaking to everybody here some of you probably are out there you know nodding your head saying yeah i've had experiences with my garden you know whatever some of you might be from the city and you're saying i don't know the first thing about this you can't just come out and plant some things and there you go and the animals will leave it alone they have a way of finding it you know i didn't think the moose would be you know over and where that one area was where i put my garlic at because it was kind of a not a real nice area and things with a lot of logging damage in that area and i thought i'll just you know grow my you know, kind of a hidden garden he found it so um another thing how are you going to preserve your harvest when you have your garden or your orchard or whatever else another part of that is food preservation um, you'd be shocked how much food you can actually grow and uh which i think it'd be important to remember here as we go into the future <laughs> very uncertain times coming but um how do you preserve it through canning through dehydrating through you know whatever a root cellar type of thing we talked about that in one of the other uh, seminars um another thing to consider a tractor if you're going to have a tractor or if you're going to do it by hand in terms of do you have a field area on your property that you could actually you know uh, go and, and till it and whatever else that you have to do could you actually use a tractor or would you just want to do it all by hand uh, that's another thing another skill set and whatever else again i have no experience at all with that i've you know, i was raised in the woods but there are farm farms all around us growing up i'm very familiar with being on farms um but i just never i'd help out with harvesting and things like that but i never you know used an actual tractor and and did the, all the planting and everything else um so uh the property that we own actually used to be um a potato farm it's probably about five or six acres of you know tillable land that used to actually be um, that they used to raise potatoes on it it's now all grown over and it's you know a lot of uh red raspberries and and um fireweed and, and things like that but uh again another thing to consider um preserving seeds for the next year i knew i again i know a lot of different people and, and they would you know some of them get really good at that and they get these heirloom seeds and you can harvest so much of your crop and then you keep some of the seeds behind so that you can grow them again the next year and it's a whole other skill set you know to get into that type of thing um, and you get into the, a lot of the seeds that you get at the store, you know, some of that stuff's GMO and not real good. So these are all things you have to think about is what I'm trying to say. Um, when you decide to go off grid or even if you're on grid and you say, hey, I want to have a garden. Uh, it's a pretty big subject. Um, we had gardens growing up. Um, my father would uh, he had the old little harrow, the little thing that you could push it has a two handles coming up one big wheel in the front and you could put different types of like a little plow blade thing and you just push it and you can do the rows that way and um we would go out and one of my jobs one of my chores in the summer months was going out and weeding the garden and then you had to go out and pick green beans and you know 
So I'm used to that type of a thing. Um, but we don't really do it where we're at right now. Um, another thing to consider in terms of growing your food is what is what is the uh, family pantry your slash pantry yearly needs? In other words, um, can you grow enough and harvest enough that it will last you through preserving it that you can last the whole way through to the next growing season, to the next harvest season? That's really kind of the goal that you want to get to um, with some things, maybe not everything, but that's kind of a goal that you can set for yourself to be able to have that family pantry where you can provide your own food. Um, and again, moving forward into the future, that might be the only option um, if you want to you know, be able to eat well. And another thing to think about when you are considering all of this and you get into the off-grid life and whatever, and that is um, if you invest in a property that has a field that you can grow a lot of stuff in, you know, a lot of crops or whatever they might be, would you be willing to sell the extra harvest, the extra crops or whatever else? That can be a, a form of income. I mean, you get into some of the really good um, organic heirloom type of growing things i mean you can actually sell that stuff there's a farmer's market not too far from here you can take your produce and you can trade and you can sell and you can do all kinds of stuff a lot of that is really neat i mean we have neighbors here even in the town of Patton, that uh they grow their own food and, and things they have gardens in their backyards and they grow food and they'll put a little stand out along the road and you can go over and buy things we we buy things from our neighbors um to kind of just support them and and you know it's a great habit to get into so if you can grow enough that you have enough for yourself and you say, hey, we have a lot of extra, might be another source of income. Again, things to think about. Uh, there's, there's a lot. When you, get, when you get into the off-grid living thing, there's a lot of things that you can do. It's not some boring kind of a life that you just sit, sit around, nothing to do. Oh, my, no. All right, so number two, we're going to talk about raising food. Just throw up a little picture here of uh, some livestock well-known different types of livestock raising food okay question number one what type of animals can survive your climate okay there are some animals that might not be able to survive in a really far north environment some might not be able to survive in a really hot environment again that's a thing to consider what kind of climate do you have what type of animals would be best suited for that climate um, will those animals be safe from predators um, larger livestock, there's not really a whole lot around this area that's going to hurt larger livestock. I mean, black bears, but they're really, you don't really hear of them attacking livestock that much. At least I haven't since I've been here. Um, you know, smaller livestock like chickens, well, there's a lot here that can kill a chicken. Um, you have to be careful about that. I mean, we have uh, really active coyotes on our property right now. Um, but we've seen fishers, uh, we've seen, you know, even a uh, lynx. Um, so there's a lot of different animals and little short-tailed weasels too. They, they're, you know, can take out chickens. Um, and our dog certainly is not going to protect livestock. He'd probably join with all the predators in, in killing them. <laughs> uh, he likes to kill mice, but, you know, he's still a puppy. He's, he's actually killed four of them already, even as a little puppy. So we're looking forward to him getting bigger and killing more mice. But um, he's not really a livestock guardian type of dog. If you want one of those, the best type, uh, most, most well-known are the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the Great Pyrenees. Great Pyrenees are really good livestock um, protecting, guarding dogs. Again, something to research if you're into that. Um, you know, what all can you get? From your livestock you know just some things you know milk uh, raw milk uh, all the different milk products be it butter and cheese and you know get into kefir and, and uh, other things like that um, eggs from your chickens or duck eggs or there's a what's the small one quail i think or something i think there's some people that raise those um, different types of meat um, again if you're raising your meat yourself it's going to be a lot healthier a lot better for you uh, we're very blessed to have uh, farms in the area that raise, you know, grass-fed meats and things, so we can go to them and support them. Um, 
wool if you have a, a sheep or different types of you know even some goats and things you can actually shear them and take that wool and you can you know make it into things um another good option there uh, raw honey i've seen a lot of people doing that in the area um that's another good thing to think about and there's so many more i mean there's obviously a lot that you can do um my sister older sister and her husband down in excuse me down in west virginia they actually raise black angus i think they have usually right around maybe 12 anywhere from 12 to 20 head of of black angus down there that they they also have the uh, highland type of cow the ones that are really furry and and things uh real long hair um so and they you know it's kind of funny steak to them and and really nice meat like that is just sort of a oh we haven't steak again you know it's because they have so much of it whole freezers full of the the meat they you know keep some for themselves and then they sell some as well for money a very smart thing to do I mean, there's a lot of money in grass-fed meat if you can grow them yourself um but what's one of the downsides to raising food well um animals need to be fed and watered every day no exception uh, especially when you get into milk cows um i've known dairy farmers that you know they eventually retire and they don't know what to do with themselves because they're used to the routine of you get up you know four o'clock in the morning or something and you're out milking by five o'clock year round seven days a week and that's just the way it is you know and then you do it you know some will do it you know once a day or twice a day depending on how you want to do the dairy thing there but um you lose your freedom um right now our little dog that we have we take him with us and he's the only animal but if we eventually have a lot of livestock you're there you can't travel unless you have a neighbor that can take care of your animals um you're pretty much stuck to your property at that point in time so that's another thing to consider are there farms in your area that you can support with your money and get your milk and your meat and your eggs and whatever else you're giving them the money that they're looking for and you're getting the really good high quality produce and not produce per se but the meat and everything else um in return so that's something to think about um check into that stuff again if you're looking to buy a uh, property someplace are there any farm stands? Are there any raw milk producers in the area? Are any grass-fed meat people in the area or whatever else? Check into that stuff. Because you know, when you first buy an off-grid property and you're and you're trying to develop that property, you're going to be very busy. And so it would be nice to find a farm in the area that would actually have the really good foods for you. And as the grocery stores, their supply chain issues are are there and they're really bad. Local farms aren't really affected that much by supply chain issues because, you know, the cattle are right over that way and we sell them right in here and <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, we milk the cows right over there and then we bring the milk over to here and put it in there and you can, that's where you buy it. The chickens are over that way and we bring the eggs in and we sell them right here. You know, it's, they don't have all that overhead cost type of stuff of a grocery store. And there's no big truck bringing it from the big factory farms to the grocery store. So those are big things to think about. Um, there's another issue with the thing of cattle, especially, and that is the danger of big animal accidents. All right. Um, if you have, you know, some big bull and he decides that he's going to, he's having kind of a bad day or whatever else, they can crush you. And um, the one farmer that we know, um, he's bigger than I am and he's, he's a big guy. He's probably about six foot five, maybe somewhere in there and probably 250 to 275 pounds, something like that. He's a big guy. And we went over there the one day and his wife came out and she said, you know, sorry, we don't have the milk right now. We're trying to go, I'll go get some for you and everything. But she said, you know, he just got, you know, our, one of our bulls actually, you know, really cornered him and smashed him into the one wall and then it, it was stepping him on him and things i guess he had to go to the hospital uh the thing really beat him up um again my older sister she was in the one stall and and this big bull he was a nice 
you know, he wasn't really cranky or mean, but he just kind of stepped off to the side. And when he did, she was beside him and, and boom, smashed her into the wall and be, between him and the wall and kind of broke a couple of ribs in her. So, um, you know, there, that's something to think about again. Um, something to think of. Uh, another thing. Um, a lot of people, they get like chickens, especially, and you basically become tied to the feed mill then. Um, there are ways that you can pasture raise your chickens. There are different types of feed. A lot of really interesting um, new thoughts on that. But pretty much if you have chickens, you're going to be buying grain at some point in time. Um, we, we've looked into the whole thing of having chickens. We have had them on our property. Um, but you know, there's, we just don't, the dependence upon the store is kind of defeating the purpose because, you know, the whole idea of really true off-grid living is to become more self-sufficient and self-sustaining. So, oh, hey, Russia's attacking and it's destroying our fuel supply. So the price of fuel goes up and then they can't get the, you know, vehicles to the, you know, deliver the food to the grocery store or the feed to the mill or whatever else. Well, if you're off grid, the, the whole concept here is um, I don't need to care about that stuff. There are some things I can get from the store, but I can do without that. And we can produce our own food and whatever else on our property. So the thing of feed mills, you know, I've seen some of these people in there. Oh, we have this off grid homestead and they get, you know, this huge, big amount of feed from the, the mills or tractor supply store or something like that. Well, it might be a little bit of a savings of money, but when you factor in all the different costs and everything, um, sometimes it makes more sense to actually just pay a local farmer and say, okay, you raise that. I'm going to do focus on other things here. Um, another thing that you have to consider is local zoning laws. Um, you might not, you know, depending on where you're at, you know, usually around here, nobody cares. You know, you there are actually people in town here that have chickens. You can hear the chickens, you know, the roosters crowing in the morning when we're here really early. Um, most people don't care. But if you're in certain areas, they might say, hey, your, your property is not zoned agricultural. You're, you're not allowed to have those chickens or that, that pig or whatever else, or especially get up into the really big animals. Um, you know, you have a milk cow in your backyard or something. They might not like that. So again, you need to check into that. So finally, we will talk about the last one, the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart that I've been doing the longest, and that is foraging. Foraging for wild berries. Um, when I was a little boy, that was what I lived for in the summer months. And I can't tell you how many times I got in trouble because I was out stuffing wild berries into my mouth and when I was supposed to be coming in for supper and then I was you know and it, being a, a dumb little boy you know and they come in and were you eating berries no you know and purple stains on my mouth and my fingers and I wasn't eating berries <laughs> so um but yeah we had a lot growing up and it's always been something I'd love to do um and these are one of the more prolific ones on up here especially if your property's recently been logged if you buy a property that's been logged red raspberries are one of the first plants that will get into that soil the birds will plant the seeds for you um and they'll just start to grow and especially if you have a lot of logging damage branches and things like that red raspberries love that whole thing and the nice thing is too a lot of animals love the red raspberries as well so that'll draw in the right right kind of uh wild game but red raspberries are very prolific up here this here is a picture of uh, black raspberries i don't think that they are in maine i know that they were in pennsylvania but i don't think i've ever seen them in maine um i think it's probably a little bit too cold for them up here there's a lot of different types of wild red raspberries there's um we used to call the one uh, we called them wine berries they were down in Pennsylvania, that's probably not the real term, but that's how it was raised. We called them that. And they're a little bit more tart than a regular red raspberry up here. Um, but very good. And you can definitely pick, you know, a large quantity of them. And 
this is one of the ones that's a lot more prolific. Uh, here's another type of berry that we have, the uh, red carats, kind of like this one here is what it looks a little bit more like. Some of that other stuff is kind of cultivated, but um, red carats, uh, they actually were destroying them in different areas because they supposedly make a blight or something on the white pine trees. And so the logging operations are coming in and spraying all kinds of things, glyphosate and whatever else to kill them. Um, but they're also very tasty. You can find these up here. Uh, we did not have those in Pennsylvania. So that's another thing that we really like. There's some of those on our land, which we're happy for. Um, these blackberries uh, are also very good. They're not real sweet. They have a little, they're somewhat sweet, but a little kind of, of a, I don't know what you would want to call it, a little slight bitter bitterness to them as well. But we had these in Pennsylvania, same thing that we have up here. And um, we have a good amount of them on our land. Uh, again, just very sporadically throughout the property. And we kind of get to know where the certain areas are. And that's another thing that takes time. You'll start to hike in areas and things and, oh, wow, there's a whole big patch of whatever here. And wow, that's really neat. And, um, and then you learn that spot and you can come back to that spot year after year. Sometimes it won't yield that much. Other times, depending on the rain, the humidity, the whatever, some plants actually like more of a dry uh, summer. And depending on what you have, um, you can actually get quite a few of them. So, um, and here's another one that Maine is very well known for, uh, especially down south, the southern part of Maine, the huge big blueberry fields. Uh, wild blueberries here in Maine are incredible. They are really neat. And, um, you know, they're, the, they're smaller than the cultivated type, but the taste is much better. Um, that's the way it is with most wild things. Our apples here, a lot of times are very, they're smaller. They're not the real huge, big ones you get in the store. Although we have some of those on our property with bigger apple trees. But the wild ones that you see as you're going along trails or out old roads and whatever else, they're a lot smaller, but they taste really good. And very sim same thing with the blueberries. Um, and blueberries are a northern superfood. So as red currants are as well, they're, the health benefits are really high with this type of berry. And so, again, understanding, you say, well, what a waste of time going out and looking for a few berries and whatever. The nutritional value of wild edibles is so far beyond anything that you can raise or grow. That's why I'm a big advocate of it. Um, there's all this talk about, you know, uh, or is it uh, pasture raised? Is it organic? Is it, you know, non-GMO certified? What it, when it's wild? You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Okay. Um, and another thing, of course, would be uh, mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are a, a really big thing. We're learning more about those. Last year was our first year getting uh, chanterelle mushrooms. We found some. We were out kayaking in one lake, and we, there was a area where it kind of came out um, like a little peninsula type of thing or something, I guess. Not an island, but kind of came out from the one part of the lake. And we went on there and there was chanterelle mushrooms on it, which were incredible. Um, but there's so many things out in the wild that you can pick. And even I'm, I'm talking about berries right now, but even herbs and things like that. There are a lot of wild herbs that are very high medicinal and um, really good stuff. Another example of these, I think, are probably the first wild edibles that I know of that come in here in Maine. Um, the wild strawberries and uh, they are very tiny as you can see in that person's fingers right there they're just little tiny things but they taste really good um so and of course you have to be careful if you see some along the roadside they might be sprayed they might somebody might have gone by and sprayed weed killer on them or something or or uh whatever uh, you have to be careful about that don't pick them in public areas unless you know for sure that it hasn't been sprayed um, I pick them in areas where nobody would be spraying chemicals on them. That's a very important thing. But uh, certain things like the wild strawberries, they're just there's never enough of them. You can't pick them really to the point of wow, there's 
you know, we'll have plenty for the whole winter and into next year or something. No, usually not. There's these are more of just you pick them and you eat them right then, or you might pick them and put them in some, you know, yogurt or whatever other things that you want to put them in. But uh, very, they taste very good. Um, wild red raspberries, like I said earlier, there's usually enough that you can store them up uh, more than you can pick. I mean, we've picked different days. We've had five gallon buckets filled with red raspberries. Um, red carrots, you can find some, you know, pretty good amount, but not going to be a huge yield with those. Blackberries are similar to red raspberries. If you have enough of them, then, you, you know, it's just, it's a plant and you can see that there will be a lot on the plant. And of course, when they're red, that means that they're not ripe yet. They'll turn that really, really nice, dark, almost a black color. Um, blueberries. Phew. You go into some of the areas, there's different types of blueberries. There's the low bush and then the high bush. The low bush ones are just a few inches high. And um, I think I've told this story before, but I'll just say it again to you know illustrate my point here. Um, went over to Baxter State Park, and uh, which is the north entrance of the Appalachian Trail. Mount Katahdin is where the Appalachian Trail gets started or where it ends up, depending on which way you're going. And um, we were driving around back in there and this park ranger, you know, he comes flying up behind me and he's flashing his lights. And I thought, oh, man, what did I do? <laughs> I thought I was in trouble. Pulled over and he pulls up beside me. And he said, hey, do you want some blueberries? I said, well, yeah. And he said, here, come on, follow me. And we, he took me down to this one area, one of the campsite areas. And it was a big field, a whole field of blueberries. Um, it looks very similar to this kind of a thing. You can kind of see behind there hand here it's out of focus but you can see just little small it's like almost like a ground cover and the whole thing blueberries and he said he said i'm just getting sick and tired of watching the the bears come in here and eat these he said it'd be neat you know if you, you know, pick as much as you want and um black flies were out right you know at that point in time so that kind of made it a little bit miserable black flies pollinate the blueberries and um but it was still it was neat I mean, we had, a, I took my hat off, like a, just a regular baseball hat. And I was, you know, picking them and, and, you know, I didn't have a, they have these little rake things that you can get that you can pick blueberries. You can pick red currants with them. Um, and uh, there's another one. Let's see if I can, let me just look that up quick. Um, okay. Let me show this quick here. Another one that you can pick with the little berry rake thing is this right here choke cherries um, choke cherries can be used if you cook them they're not really all that great um, raw um, you can actually ferment them and they can turn be turned into sort of a wine type of a thing and whatever else not that you're going to sit around and get drunk with it or whatever else but it's just a fermented drink um, we actually made some the one time that was wild apples and choke cherries together and they ferment a little bit made a really tasty drink um really good stuff uh, we like to um, cook them down and then we put them through a strainer and then the juice that comes out of it we have that as it's like a cherry flavored juice really tastes good and we'll actually mix it in with our um our raw milk and it makes the raw milk turn purple <laughs> it tastes like blueberry it's amazing and um you know and people up here most people don't even bother with these things they just drive right by them you see them along the road the trees are just sagging with all these choke cherries and uh, you can pick a lot of them pretty quickly and uh see if i can look up a berry rake here just so people can know what i'm talking about um i'll go over this way here okay Right there, you can see the different types of berry rakes. Um, this is the type we have right here, this red one. But you just can go and, and it takes the berries off and usually it just leaves the leaves on there. So you can pick a lot of um, things like choke cherries or blueberries um, like that. You can pick them very quickly with that. And I mean, you go down uh, to uh, Southern Maine to some of these big blueberry plantations and they have these, you know, two-handed berry rakes and <laughs> you just 
get them and then dump them into a five gallon bucket. You can harvest huge amounts of, of berries. Um, again, wild apple trees, another big thing. Um, so foraging for wild fruits, herbs, mushrooms. Uh, there's a lot of neat things that you can get like that. And the health benefits are off the charts. They're a lot better than stuff that you'll get in the store. And another thing, which I'm not going to bother putting any pictures up because you can use your own imagination here, but um, uh, hunting and fishing. There's another great way to obtain a lot of food. Uh, talked to a guy that actually hunted up in our area here, and he got a, a moose the one time. And after all of the hide and the bones and everything was taken away, he had 900 pounds of meat. So that's a lot of meat and um, incredible stuff, of course. And, and, um, and then you have small game. You have what they call partridge or uh, patridge, if you want to say it the New England way. And um, but, you know, they are uh, grouse with like a rough grouse. There's um, uh, turkey, wild turkey. There's I mean, there's a lot of different wild animals here. You have to, again, study it for your area. Um, different types of deer and things. I know when I was in Montana, um, they had white-tailed deer, but they also had mule deer out there, plus elk and moose, um, where my brother was at. You get up into Alaska, they have caribou up there. and There's just so many different things that you can get, and you can literally shoot um, some of these bigger animals like that, um, hunting license and the whole deal. I'm not saying going out and poaching or whatever, but I'm saying... You can go out and you can, you know, get an animal like that and then you have your year's worth of meat. So that's another thing that is definitely a possibility for those who want to go off grid. Um, finding food, you know, the hunter gatherer type of a thing, in other words. And can you do that 100 percent? I don't know. Some people have tried. I, I mean, I guess maybe you could if you were really dedicated or something and you had didn't have much else to do. But, um, you know, going and supporting local farmers with the produce that they sell, with the, um, you know, the, the meat, the milk, the cheese, the whatever else, it's good for the local economy. It helps out people. So that's going to be it for what I had to say on that. Um, we definitely are more of the option number three, the finding food. Um, we enjoy that very much. I've always liked to go fishing and hunting. Since I was a boy, lots of stories on that. And um, of course, you know, foraging for wild edibles is great as well. So, does anybody have any questions about this? Did I miss anything? Would anybody like to add any other things to this? If you want to write a question, just write question in capital letters. And then after that, whatever your question is, that helps me see it better. So, I'll just leave the blueberries up there just to torture people. <laughs> hobo fishing kit is cheap solution for fishing. Not sure what a, what you mean by hobo fishing kit. Maybe just a, like a line, like a string and a hook and stuff like that. That might be what you mean, I guess. I could spend another couple hours on fishing and um, and hunting and things in the proper tools of the trade we'll say um i'm kind of a bit of a fanatic for that stuff i actually got into something this this past year um a tinkara rod for fishing fly fishing it doesn't have a reel it just it's a telescoping rod that you take it out and then you just kind of you can kind of flip your fly out into the water and whatever else and and um pretty neat you can carry it, you know, telescopes down to just a little tube, throw it in your backpack or whatever else, and you can pack into places and, and things. So experimented with that this past year. But uh, question, what kind of apples are grown near you? Um, wild ones. <laughs> I, I don't really know if they have names to them. Um, you know, in terms of... Uh, you know, Granny Smith or Macintosh or whatever. I don't really know. I think those are more cultivated type, but um, 
there's so many different types of wild apples up here. There's some that are just bright red. There's some that are red and yellow, you know, different colors. Um, there's some that are green apples. There's um, some that are all yellow and they, they have different flavors to them and, and things. Um, sometimes you'll see an apple hanging from a tree. Like there's a, the, the ATV trails are just notorious. You go through the, like the um, field areas and there'll be apple trees and the apples are just all over the trail um, in the fall. And there's times I'd picked an apple and, you know, as I'm riding by, just reach up and grab an apple, you know, and stand up and grab one. And you'd take a bite and you're like, ah, oh, it doesn't even taste that good. And then you go down a little bit further and there's a one and, oh, that's really good, actually. It tastes really neat. So um, I don't know. I've never actually talked about it to anybody about um, can you actually classify these wild apple trees? Because I think it's more of a pollination thing, the way that the, the bees just pollinate it, that it comes out some are really small little apples other ones get full size or i don't know i'm not an expert on um, identifying wild apples um i missed this one here how hard is it to raise beef um I don't really have a lot of experience with it, but it's if you have enough pasture land where they can go out and they can eat the grasses and things, and then you can move them from that pasture to another pasture, let the grass regrow. It's not a real big deal. Um, you have to watch their health and whatever else and, and things, but um, you know, it's not, it's not impossible for people. Um, question aquaponics are, area independent only the plants are dependent on weather my country pushing local farmers to get into aquaponics it saves on water and very efficient run on solar yeah I, I it's something i've heard of people have sent me links to things but i've never really looked into it much if someone doesn't own a lot of land how can they go foraging without risk of trespassing um, a lot of times you can find uh, national parks local parks state parks and usually the the park rangers you know, they will say, okay, hey, you can go in here and forge and get some stuff. Usually, sometimes they can get weird about it, but, um, you know, you can go in and you can pick wild edibles and do some foraging there. I mean, if you're coming in with a tractor, you know, with a big wagon or something and trying to haul off everything, they will have a problem with that. But, um, and, it, you know, if you'd see something, somebody's property, they're not picking it, you can always go talk to them as well and just say, hey, do you mind if I pick some berries out there or whatever? <clears throat> um, how about cherries, nuts, and elderberries? Yeah, nuts. I forgot to, to mention about that. Um, there are different types of nuts out there. We have um, hazelnuts, beaked hazelnuts on our property. That's another one. Uh, I did not mention that. Um, so, yeah, that's another one. But uh, cherries. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they had a, a what was called a bird cherry. Prudus avium was the botanical name for the tree, and we had that growing up, and they were really good, like a little black cherry. And then there was the actual black cherry tree, which is more of a timber tree. That's Prunus serotina was the botanical name for that tree. I studied botany for a little while, but um, those had really small little cherries, like the choke cherry tree. They weren't really all that edible. Um, elderberries, we actually have um, both the like the black elderberry here, and then also the red elderberry which the red elderberry, I don't usually mess with that um, because they say that the seed is really bad. They can put you into a coma if you eat it. So from what I've studied, I haven't ever tried it. I just kind of, okay, not really worth it. And the the animals and birds and things, they really like the, the red elderberries. So I just hands off, let the birds have them. Um, Yeah. Yeah, we actually went out and spent a pretty good day foraging for for the uh, big hazelnuts, and um, and you know spent a, you know a lot of time. We got a, a good amount of them, and I 
was under the impression that you let them dry out, you know, just put them out, kind of dehydrate them almost, put them in the sunlight, let them dry. And then when they kind of crack open, then you can get the nut out and everything, but ended up drying the nut out too. So that was not a real smart thing to do uh, because they're not very big. The nut inside almost, you know, you better off just eating it when it's, you know, the plant itself is green, uh, just raw like that. Don't try to roast them or anything. They're very tiny little nuts. Um, of course, down in Pennsylvania, we had black walnuts. We had English walnuts. We had uh, all the different types of hazelnut, um, which, you know, the, the other thing that's really neat about um, wild edibles, oftentimes animals like them just as much as we do. So you can actually get to know where the different trees are at and uh, like the partridge up here, grouse, whatever you want to call them, they love apples. And so if you have a good apple tree, a good, you know, like a, a grove of apple trees or whatever else, you'll see grouse there. And um, I remember when I was a boy, I got so good with hunting the gray squirrels down in Pennsylvania. I could, I could walk through the woods and I could hear them chewing the hazel, hazelnuts. Um, or the hickory, not hazelnuts, excuse me, hickory nuts. Shag bark and pig nut hickory um, trees. And then they had the, the hickory nuts and they'd be up in the tree to, you know, chewing on it. And I, I could listen for that sound and I would just look up and see where they're at and then squirrel meat. Um, question, I get organic frozen wild berries at the store here in the city. Do you think those are good to get or do they do something to the berries? Of course, I'd like to pick my own regardless. Um, probably good depending on where they're coming from. Um, and another little scam I'll let everybody know about here in Maine. Um, they have been doing this for a very long time. I uh, knew a realtor that was telling me about this and we saw it being done. They only harvest a, a certain number of blueberries and then they destroy the rest of the crop to keep the price up of the blueberries. <laughs> I'm not joking. They, have, they used to burn the blueberry fields and things and they also put poison on the blueberry fields to keep the price inflated. So, real nice. Question, can I get your opinion or some suggestions on what would be a good state to move to for off-grid living from Chicago, Illinois? Um, in your area, I'd say maybe maybe uh, Michigan, Upper Peninsula, depending on how far out you want to go. If you don't want really remote areas, then, you know, there might be some areas, um, you know, maybe Iowa or you know, maybe some areas of Illinois or whatever, farm country, back roads. But if you really want the wilderness, northern living, Upper Peninsula, Michigan is a good spot if you're in the Midwest. Uh, okay. Question. What is Oliver's favorite food to forage? Hmm. Um, he's been a fanatic for it. I mean, even the weird part is it's kind of a weird story here, but when he was in um, my, you know, in the womb of my wife, we would actually say we're going to go pick berries and he would he would actually kick when we would say that and we tried a couple times we'd say no nah, it couldn't have been about berries and we'd say about okay let's go get some uh you know we'd say some other word and then we'd say berries and and he would start kicking again <laughs> so he's been a fanatic for a very long time all of his life he's loved wild berries um he prefers i think probably the wild strawberries are probably his favorite but he likes blueberries as well um, but he loves the strawberries. Um, are there any honeybees near you? What kind of honey is sold near you? We do have some people that, that do honey, like wild honey in our area. And on our land, there definitely are honeybees. Um, they're actually not real aggressive or anything else. We, we can be out picking red raspberries and they're just kind of flying around. And there's been times that they'll land on my arm and just fly off. They don't really bother you or anything. Not the same as like a yellow jacket or a hornet. Um, question, Brother Brian, how can we reach people in the 1040 window like sending them King James Version Bibles and Bible biblical teaching? I only find ecumenical organizations doing this work and that's bad. Yeah, there's a great need out there. Um, you know, the internet is a good way to reach people, but moving forward, I don't know. Things are going to change with the whole setup of how everything works. Um, national boundaries and war and whatever 
just be open, pray about it, what the Lord would have you do. Question, have you tried beech nuts? No, I have not. The small green apples are called crab apples, not fit to eat. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean the small, like the, I know what, I should make a mention of that, crab apples, yeah. I'm talking, we actually have apples on our property that are smaller green ones, maybe about the size of a, like a golf ball or something. They're a little bit bigger. They're not quite the same size as a big apple. Um, and they were actually really good. The one, our one old apple tree um, had green apples. So they're good. But the beech nuts, that's another one I forgot to mention. Um, we had those down in Pennsylvania. We have them here. Kind of a little triangular shaped nut thing. And no, I've never gotten around to trying those. I always forget myself. And I think, you know, the little squirrels, little red, brown squirrels, whatever, those little guys, they usually get them. Um, so I don't really see that many of them. But um, I have not tried those. I'd like to sometime. Question, are there any succotash, turnip, squash, and such um, being sold in the area? Or, I'm not really sure. Um, we don't really grow that much in terms of, uh, uh, you know, gardens and whatnot at this point. So... Same question as the previous person. What do you think is a good location for off-grid living? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you. Well, there's probably some good areas in Arizona that uh, um, would be a good place or good, you know, yeah, good place to go off-grid. Um, again, you'd have the hot climate there and whatever else. You might have the challenges of, you know, more of a desert type of climate and things. So just do some research. If you want to move north, you know, if you're in Arizona, maybe uh, like some areas of Wyoming, maybe Idaho, Montana, places like that would be good. Um, do you use loofahs? No, I don't. We have we have a few around, but uh, I don't really use them that much. Loofah sponge, it's, people don't know what that is. Huckleberries, yeah. My brother, when he was in Montana, he uh, was really big on They'd go out picking huckleberries, but I don't think we have them here, unfortunately. So I'm going to try to stick with the uh, off-grid type of thing here. So we actually had an apple tree out along the end of our property out near the road. And it had these kind of ugly little yellow apples on them. And uh, they weren't real big. And I just kind of thought, eh, you know, they'll just let those ones fall down. They actually were getting ripe and falling first. And I just thought, eh, they don't look that nice. Those are usually pretty bad tasting and whatever. You know, usually there's another tree we have that has the yellow apples and um, and didn't think to pick any. And, and so we were out actually with our apple picker, the big, long, extending type with a little claw there and in the basket. And we were out picking some. I saw one. I thought, well, I'll just try one. And I picked it and tasted it. And Oh, man, it was so good. Just so sweet, like a honey sweetness to it. And I thought, oh, man, so we were not ready for that. Um, we have so many apple trees on our property that we just can't pick them all. Um, so I'll just answer this one quick. Can I translate your videos from English to Spanish? Yes, you can. As long as you don't change the content. That's all I ask. Um, black chaga. Yeah. Chaga mushroom. We have those around. We do find those occasionally. If you don't know what chaga mushroom is, it's, you can, basically take it and chop it into pieces and then put it in with some boiling water and you can make a really nice black real dark black like a coffee look um, like a tea and it's extremely healthy um, really good very high in magnesium question do you make your own bread um, I never made my own bread my wife does um, she can make bread um, we haven't been able to in a while because we just haven't had an oven really all that accessible and things. Um, you know, right now we, we just cook everything on a wood stove, so no way to, to cook anything on the inside of the wood stove <laughs> uh, as far as baking is concerned. And I know that you can get little, you know, oven or stovetop 
little oven things or whatever Coleman used to make them, but we don't bother with that. Um, so right now we don't really do much with bread. So. Crazy story about Chaga. My old neighbor got rid of her stomach cancer with it. She made tea. You actually heard the one time that um, when they had the Chernobyl incident there in um, the northern part of Russia in Siberia, um, that the people who survived it were the ones that were drinking Chaga regularly. So supposedly I've heard that it can take um, any kind of radioactive type of stuff out of your body. Um, it's, it's good stuff. It really is. I, I love the taste of it. So. And of course, I, you know, I'm not sure too. you know, you, you get down more down south and you can grow peaches and pears and other things as orchard type trees as well. Um, Growing up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, we, the road I grew up on was called Peach Lane because the, the one farm actually had a big peach orchard. So I don't know if people can grow that up here or not. I, I haven't really looked into that. We're more just, you know, into the wild edible type of stuff. Automation is killing jobs and the government won't be there to help us. We have to learn to be self-sufficient. A big amen to that. Absolutely. I have pear and plum trees. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. That's pretty neat. We, we're still fairly new on our property. We haven't really had time to develop much of it or whatever else. Um, Why don't hirelings get exposed by their own people, especially the millionaire ones that can help the homeless and whatnot? People that go to church building are church buildings are under peer pressure and mind control. That's why most of them never go after the pastor. They're afraid of being made fun of from the pulpit and whatever, which the pastors will do. It's happened to me. Um Question, I know it's off topic, but what do you think of the situation with Ukraine? The whole world seems to be against Russia, Putin. It's it's a big issue. Um, they're just going to use this thing to continue messing with the economy and whatever else. It's just disgusting. And again, you just have to get to the point like the early earlier comment or there said Bill um, up there. Uh, you just have to get to a point where you're self-sufficient. And you just say whatever i can find food on my own i actually heard of the story of there was a guy out in idaho um and uh, he wrote a book rick shaben i think his name is his, i have his book someplace here and um his grandmother went through the nazi holocaust and she was in one of the death camps and they had her you know out working in the cruise she was just a young girl at the time but they had her out working in the you know work teams and whatever else and she knew wild edibles and so while the other prisoners were starving, the she said the guards, when they would look away, she'd grab a couple, you know, wild edibles, quick stuff them in her mouth and back to work. <laughs> and she survived. She got through it. Everybody else was starving and getting sick, and she survived. So I mean, even worst case scenario of you're in a camp someplace and whatever else, if you know, if you can spot the dandelion greens, those will keep you alive. And any kind of wild berries and whatever else, they'll they'll do very good for your system. So, question, do you think we will be here when they start banning private food production? Well, they already did it in Michigan, that stupid woman, uh, governor or whatever, she was trying to ban people from having gardens because of COVID or something. <laughs> what? What's that have to do with anything? So they, yeah, they'll, they'll go after stuff. Of course they will. You know, they're, your cows leaving too much gas out into the atmosphere with, you know, flatulence or whatever else and he's he's warming the planet you know 
we have to tax it or you have to get rid of it. You just eventually just say, whatever, uh, God's going to protect me. Just that simple. Question, raising livestock. Is there any reason from a nutritional sense to avoid raising unclean animals, Old Testament pigs, etc.? Your thoughts, thanks. In the New Testament, um, there are no more unclean animals. That has been done away with. So to go back to that, if you're Jewish or something and you don't want to eat pork, well, that's fine. But, um, you know, again, look for the animals that grow very well in your area and raise those. There's no prohibitions in the New Testament about reading, eating any type of animal. If you like pork, then eat pork. Plain and simple. And, well, there's, you know, I can prove studies, though. I get this thing all the time from people. I can show you study after study where it shows that that you know pork products have parasites in them and all this other stuff. Okay, where are they raised? Oh, well, they're raised on factory farms. That's right. You know, look into uh, Joel Saladin. Um, he's a guy that's into a lot of the pastured raising of different things, and he actually raises his swine out in the woods, uh, woodland swine, um, and you know we buy some of that in our area. And it's really good stuff. It does not taste like the pork that you get from the store. So, I mean, you can you can raise anything bad, including fruits and vegetables, and GMO and whatever. You can raise uh, cattle in really disgusting environments and, and milk, you know, milk the cows in really bad environments. And, and you have to, you know, pasteurize it, homogenize it, destroy every kind of nutritional thing in it just to make it, you know, so that it won't kill you when you drink it. I mean, it, you can make bad things about anything like that. So. Um, question what foods do you stray away from um, foods I don't mess with are ones that have a lot of preservatives in them a lot of processed foods and things like that so uh, but that's going to be it I guess for this video here um, tomorrow I think is the one let me see what, what my notes here yeah, number number twelve, off grid seminar number twelve, um, on the uh, the terrible toilet. So um, talking about um, getting rid of waste, or uh, rather rather maybe utilizing waste on a off grid property. Um, so my different experiences with that. Um, so we will end this one for now. Um, So, yeah, we'll, we'll end this one here, and then we'll be back tomorrow with talking about um, the ultimate subject there. You know, with a lot of most people, most people, when you talk off-grid, they'll say, I don't want to have an outhouse. That's the first thing that most people think of. It's this terrible thing to have an outhouse. I just can't imagine having an outhouse. Um, it's not quite as bad as you'd think, first and foremost, and there are alternatives to it. So, actually, you know, when you get off-grid for a while, you know, I actually don't like flush toilets now. So, um, but, uh, so that's going to be it. And uh, we will see everybody tomorrow in the off-grid seminar part 12. So thank you very much for watching. Please make sure to hit the like button to help the video get ranked.